88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz, and online at kpfa.org. The time is 2 p.m. Stay tuned next for Terra Verde. The Amazon Basin, from the magnificent redwoods of California to the icy majesty of the Arctic, life on Earth faces an unprecedented threat from careless development. Join Terra Verde over lunch today to find out about the unfolding future of the planet. Good afternoon and welcome to Terra Verde, a weekly environmental show on KPFA and KPFB in Berkeley and KFCF in Fresno. I am Antonia Juhas and after 15 years or more of enjoying the unique privilege of appearing as a frequent guest on KPFA and many other Pacifica stations, I am distinctly honored today to appear for the first time as host. Joining the incredible Terra Verde team with Michelle, Jason, and Maureen. Um, as many of you, of you know, even though I'll give you a brief introduction to myself, um, I'm an energy analyst, author, and investigative journalist um, specializing in all things oil. I've written three books. The most recent is Black Tide, The Devastating Impact of the Gulf Oil Spill. And I've written for a lot of news outlets, including Rolling Stone, The Nation, Harper's, The Atlantic, The Advocate, Ms., CNN, The New York Times, uh, many others. And most recently, um, I was very proud to do a five-part series on COP21, the United Nations Paris Climate Negotiations for Newsweek. I'm thrilled to join KPFA today and the entire KPFA and Pacifica families, including a special shout out to my father, who hosts a show on KGNU in Boulder, Colorado. Um, But today's show, perhaps not surprisingly, will focus on bad times for big oil. First, I'll discuss the reasons behind the industry's worst profit losses in decades reported this week. Then, I'm very excited that we'll be joined by acclaimed climate change lawyer, Matt Pawa, president of the Pawa Law Group in Washington, D.C. California Attorney General Kamala Harris just launched a landmark investigation into Exxon's alleged climate change lies and related misdeeds. Matt Pawa will break down the nuts and bolts of this investigation for us, what laws may have Exxon broken, um, what the legal consequences should and could be, um, what happens next, and perhaps most importantly, how you can get involved, and that this also could be a case that stretches um, beyond Exxon to other companies similar to the um, tobacco RICO case. Um, But first, big oils, big rotten financials. Um, It's been an incredible two weeks for the world's largest traded oil companies. Um, Exxon, Chevron, and BP, and Shell among them. They have reported the worst financials in a generation and in some cases in their histories. Shell is down, Shell's profits for 2015 compared to their profits in 2014 were 80 percent lower. Chevron's profits for 2015 were 76 percent lower than 2014. BP was down by 51 percent and Exxon by 50 percent. These losses are huge, but they hide even bigger problems, including Chevron's fairly unbelievable 100 percent decline in profits earned in the fourth quarter of 2015 versus 2014, and BP's 91% profit loss in the same period. This led to historic write-downs in the company's credit ratings, with one um, Business Week headline reading, Exxon faces first downgrade since depression as oil route worsens. These, among nearly a dozen more U.S. oil companies, had their credit ratings downgraded or threatened with downgrading. So what's happening? Um, Of course, the most important factor is that the price of oil has collapsed, dropping from a high of about $150 a barrel in 2008 to below $30 this week. 
and the price of oil is the, these companies like to talk about themselves as energy companies, and they certainly um, spend a lot of time, particularly now, searching for and producing natural gas. But they are oil companies, and they make their money exploring for and producing and selling oil. And when the price of oil falls, so does their um, uh, their profits, of course, and their bottom lines. Why is the price of oil falling? There's one simple answer for that, and that is that the world is oversupplied with oil. And one of the main reasons for that is that the oil companies are suffering from their own golden wishes. They're reaping what they've sown. Particularly during the Bush administration, we saw policies put into place that allowed companies to basically go virtually anywhere, anytime, in search of all of the world's oil, uh, deeper in the ocean, on more public lands, including, and as I've written extensively on, um, a war that wasn't exclusively fought for oil, but certainly had the benefit of opening up enormous amounts of previously unavailable oil to Western oil companies. Um, and that has led to a mass oversupply of oil or a mass supply of oil that has outpaced demand. And a lot of that production, um, increased production, is coming from the United States and from North Dakota's shale region. And hopefully um, some of you saw the piece that I did in Newsweek uh, with the incredible Candy Mossett of the um, Indigenous Environmental Network where I visited her home on the Fort Berthold Indian Reservation in North Dakota in the heart of the fracking boom there to see what it means to have a boom in oil production take place in your backyard in North Dakota. Um, but the sort of secret is that nobody is reducing their production. Um, the news tends to put most of the blame on Saudi Arabia, which has not reduced its production, but North Dakota hasn't produced its, redu uh, its production either, nor has Exxon for that matter, nor has Chevron. They're all producing as much or more oil than they were at this time last year. And what it is, what it amounts to is a massive game of chicken. Uh, with each country and each company waiting for the other countries and companies to drop their production so that the other countries and companies don't have to. And that's problematic for a lot of reasons, one of which is the oil companies are in trouble. They're losing lots of money, uh, and they need to show everyone that they can figure out what to do about that and, and do better. And one of the ways that they're accomplishing that is that they may be, they are in fact, <laughs> producing the same amount of oil, if not more. But they're doing it after cutting hundreds of thousands of workers, literally hundreds of thousands of workers across the world, and increasing, quote unquote, efficiency. So they're producing more with less. Now, I've spent a lot of my career covering big oil's disasters, including the BP oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico, um, including uh, the disastrous impacts of oil production in Ecuador. Um, I've been to Afghanistan looking at uh, the attempts of the U.S. Uh, invasion there to increase production, uh, to produce oil in Afghanistan. Um, and what I worry about is that by producing more with less, particularly less workers, in a more dangerous production environment. So let's remember, we're talking about oil companies now. This is no longer the age of easy oil. The last time the oil companies faced this type of economic crisis, it was in the mid-80s. And there was a very different type of oil that they were after than it was, quote-unquote, easy oil. It was easier to get to and less technically difficult to produce. Of course, if you live where the oil is being produced, it doesn't seem easy. But now we're talking about deep offshore um, fracking, much more technically difficult and dangerous forms of production. And they're doing that production with less workers and, quote, unquote, more efficiently. All of this tells us that our deep dependence on oil is problematic for reasons uh, even even broader than the environmental and climate reasons that we that we talk about often um, and that our uh, dependence, our global economic dependence 
on this resource is uh, problematic from many, many respects. The next problem that we're going to talk about, though, is the climate problem. And to join us to discuss one company in particular, Exxon's, um, very, very interesting and problematic history with climate change. I am extremely pleased to uh, have joining us by phone from Washington, D.C., Matt Pawa, president of the Pawa Law Group. Thank you for joining us today, Matt. Thank you. It's good to be with you today. Great. Thanks for joining us. Um, in addition to being president of the Pawa Legal Group, Matt is former adjunct professor of law at Boston College Law School and a regular speaker at legal symposia, including the annual Public Interest Environmental Law Conference at the University of Oregon Law School, which I and I imagine many of our listeners have attended. Matt has led some of the most important environmental cases uh, in the United States, including MTBE litigation and the first tort case against greenhouse gas polluters in 2004, which resulted in the critical 2007 Supreme Court ruling that greenhouse gases are air pollutants that may be regulated under the Clean Air Act. Um, Matt, feel free to um, add or amend anything to your introduction. Uh, you've got quite uh, an extensive and, and impressive um, bio. Um, but, but after you do that, uh, if you could then start by briefly describing for us the um, outcome of some amazing investigations by Inside Climate News, Columbia School of Journalism, and the Los Angeles Times into what Exxon knew and when about climate change before we um, delve deeply into the legal implications of those uh, findings for the state of California. The... Uh Inside Climate News uh, disclosures uh, have caused an enormous amount of attention uh, as to what Exxon knew and when it knew it. And um, the disclosures focus on documents from approximately 1977 to the early 1980s, around 1982 or 1983. And what they show is that Exxon was aware that the combustion of fossil fuels, its main product, was contributing uh, to a rise in the levels of carbon dioxide uh, in the atmosphere. Um, they, they knew enough to know that that was almost certainly the case, and they believed that that was a, uh, a scientific conclusion that um, was uh, becoming beyond any uh, real doubt. They also knew that uh, what was going to happen in the future was a rise in temperature in the earth as a result of the carbon dioxide increasing. And they said in their own words in the internal documents, uh, Exxon scientists, that there was a clear scientific consensus that this rise in, in carbon dioxide would cause a temperature increase of approximately three degrees Celsius over pre-industrial temperatures. Um, if you doubled the amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And they also uh, say uh, things like uh, that this could be potentially uh, a catastrophe uh, for the planet and that it would be extremely harmful uh, to human beings. Uh, and so all the way back in the 19, late 70s and early 80s, we have a series of documents, some of which say that they were widely circulated to Exxon management, indicating that Exxon knew the key pieces of information about global warming. Okay. And then what what did Exxon um, do or not do with that that information that could put them into a uh, into legal trouble today? Well, what they did was they uh, let many of their scientists go throughout the 1980s, and then uh, by no later than the 1990s, they were engaged in a uh, campaign of deception and denial about global warming. And they made statements directly themselves, tending to cast doubt on whether or not um, there was uh, certainty about uh, the models, the scientists themselves, the methodologies, um, whether or not we knew, if, knew enough to do anything about it, whether or not the consequences were really harmful, whether we should worry about it. Um, and they also funded uh, the denialists. And it's been widely documented that Exxon spent millions of dollars uh, paying various uh, spokespersons, either, you know, artificial turf-type groups or think tank-sounding groups, which were actually, you know, 
paid industry mouthpieces to spread this constant uh, mantra, this drumbeat that went on and on through the 90s and the 2000s, and, and to some extent continues today um, about, um, uh, you know, doubting global warming or doubting various aspects of it or attacking the models, criticizing the models. And Exxon stopped, uh, it says, direct funding of, uh, of this, the denialists, the skeptics, as they're sometimes called, um, some number of years ago, in 2007 or something approximately. Um, but uh, the denialists continue, and Exxon statements today continue uh, to question whether or not we really uh, need to do very much about global warming. And they keep saying, well, we're going to continue to burn lots of fossil fuels, and uh, essentially, don't worry. Okay, well then explain to us, you know, clearly... Uh, Exxon is a is a company that that makes its money off of producing fossil fuels, particularly uh, oil, and um, some would say you know owes it to its um, shareholders to make as much money as it possibly can off of that resource. So can you walk us through what laws um, Exxon may um, have broken and um, you know what that means? Well, uh, there are a number of laws. Uh, just about every state in the country, if not every state, prohibits unfair uh, business practices, unfair consumer trade practice statutes, as they're called. And uh, in essence, they they prohibit um, anyone or any company engaged in selling a product from making statements that are either outright false uh, or are misleading uh, or deceptive in some fashion. And in some states, including California, a literally true statement can be deceptive in context. Um, as we all know, sometimes people use sort of half half truths or truths in a very misleading way to create a misleading impression. And so the uh, the statutes are careful to catch that kind of improper behavior as well. Um, so, you know, every state in the country prohibits uh, this kind of conduct uh, of misleading statements. So there are those statutes. There are also statutes um, in every state or just about every state that are sometimes called blue sky laws that prohibit uh, deceptive or false or misleading statements in the sale of securities. So if you're if you uh, issue stock in your corporation, um, you're not allowed to make deceptive statements about that stock. Um, so those are two examples. A third fairly obvious example, given the history of major pieces of litigation in this country, is the federal RICO statute, which is a racketeering statute originally enacted to go after organized crime, but that was used very successful by the United States government against the tobacco industry. And uh, that case resulted in, in a victory for the government after a nine-month trial and wide-ranging reforms of a of a, uh, an industry that was full of really bad actors who had done really deceptive things and sold products telling them, don't worry, it's safe, you know, our products are fine, in essence, um, go ahead and use them. So those are those are three examples of, of statutes that uh, prohibit um, deceiving uh, the public when you are selling a product or, or selling um, shares in your company. And I just uh, let me do a, a identification here. Um, you're listening to Terra Verde, and uh, we are on KPFA and KPFB in Berkeley and KFCS uh, KFCF in Fresno. Um, you're listening to Matt Pawa from the Pawa um, Legal Group in Washington D.C., and we're discussing um, California State Attorney General Kamala Harris's launch of an uh, investigation into ExxonMobil and um, some of the laws that Exxon may have broken. Um, so, can you explain to us a little bit more? Um, you know, if um, it, it need, so, it seems that. Um, fairly clear, uh, at least to me, um, that through the documents that we've seen that Exxon um, knew that its product led to uh, uh, climate change and that climate change is very harmful to the planet. Um, there was even a finding in the 70s by an intern at Exxon that was revealed in these documents where that intern said, basically, we're going to need to keep 80 percent of fossil fuels in the ground to avert the worst of climate crisis, which is exactly the conversation we're just starting to have now some 30 years later. Um, but what what then 
what then needs to happen? Um, what are the consequences of if um, Exxon is found to have engaged in unfair um, competitive um, um, processes and um, broken blue sky laws? And um, you just tell us more about what the potential findings could be and what it looks like to investigate Exxon for these uh, crimes. Sure. Sure. I mean, there's 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 two basic uh, categories of remedies. One would be uh, injunctive relief, court order uh, requiring the company either to do something or not do something, and the other category of remedies, of course, are monetary damages. Um, so let's talk about the first category first. Uh, in terms of court orders. Um, a court could order a company uh, that has made deceptive statements about its product to issue corrective statements. So, for example, uh, if it were found to be the case that Exxon had engaged in deceptive conduct about its fossil fuel products with respect to global warming, um, a court could order Exxon to uh, acknowledge the truth um, that global warming is caused by its products and that there's an acute need to reduce the use of fossil fuels in order to avoid catastrophe um, and to you know make a statement that's consistent with the science. Hmm. Um, it could order Exxon to refrain from statements that continually question the competencies of the models when, in fact, we know from the Los Angeles Times that Exxon has used climate models itself to protect its own business assets for decades. Um, it could require Exxon to make available its documents, um, you know, which is what happened in the tobacco litigation. So a court uh, a judge who issues injunctive relief has a lot of flexibility to sort of tailor the relief to the nature of the situation. And if the judge finds that there has been a long pattern of uh, inappropriate conduct in violation of a consumer fraud statute, uh, for example, uh, a judge can, can order that kind of uh, broad-ranging relief to to rectify the situation so that consumers have accurate information in the marketplace. Um, and similarly, with uh, securities laws, um, a judge can order uh, injunctive relief that, that would require, you know, basically the truth. If you're finding, if, uh, if the finding in the, the legal case is that there's a falsehood, the remedy is in some some sense the truth. It's either, you know, make documents available or make corrective statements. The tobacco companies were required to take out advertisements uh, to right. correct their statements and acknowledge that they had uh, deceived the public. In terms of monetary damages, um, uh, sometimes uh, consumer fraud cases can result in um, uh, requiring a company to pay money back to consumers who purchased a product when they uh, relied on the information. Mm -hmm. um, so that's certainly a possibility. And um, in terms of the blue sky laws, uh, companies can be required to uh, essentially give back the stock to the shareholders who would not have purchased it if they had known the truth. Um, and, you know, one particularly important issue here is, you know, did shareholders purchase stocks in Exxon, you know, other fossil fuel companies, uh, not knowing that, in fact, what Exxon may have known, which is that um, he really couldn't burn its proven reserves of fossil fuels because if it did, it would be contributing to a situation where we're essentially cooking the planet. So that's a question. Um, you know, I don't know the answer to that question, but that's the kind of thing that um, a, an attorney general might be looking into. Um, we're not, at, we don't have access to to the information that the attorney general has access to, but th that's the kind of question that they would be looking at. Um, is there the possibility of um, you know, people harmed by the impacts of climate change um, being able to um, engage in some sort of um, legal fight with Exxon as a result of this type of investigation? Yeah, I, there, there certainly is always the possibility that someone who's been harmed, a you know, uh, whether it's a government representing all of its people or whether it's individual persons, farmers, or whomever, uh, victims of, of heat waves, um, could bring monetary damages cases under a theory like public nuisance against a company like Exxon. Um, I brought a couple of those cases, and mm -hmm. uh, we haven't managed to... Uh, 
to get a final judgment against uh, Exxon or other fossil fuel companies uh, yet in those kinds of cases. But, you know, you learn by doing. And it took the tobacco uh, litigation decades to get to the point where it could, you know, find the right legal theory to stick and the right way to, 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 to handle it. So we're still on the learning curve with uh, with these sort of tort law kind of uh, monetary damages cases for, you know, personal injury or property damage. Uh, for, for global warming, but the, the law is maturing, it's evolving, you know, we've established standing in the cases that we've brought so far, we've eliminated a lot of defenses, and, uh, you know, a state like California um, is really feeling the brunt in the United States. Of all the places in the U.S., you know, Alaska and uh, the west coast of the United States are, are getting it the worst, and California, along with Washington and Oregon, are losing their snowpack year after year. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there may be high snowpack years and low snowpack years, but the trend overall going out into the future is very clear. And that's, of course, uh, California's reservoir, source of drinking water for much of the year. Um, so, you know, California could be looking at whether or not it is it it, uh, it needs to be compensated in part for Exxon's fair share of the global warming problem. You know, obviously there's other um, entities that have contributed. Exxon's not alone, but uh, Exxon has over the years supplied uh, a whole lot of the uh, fossil fuels that have caused a whole lot of carbon to go up into the atmosphere. We don't have a lot of time, but I'm wondering just quickly, um, there has been discussion that similar to the tobacco case that there could be um, a RICO case involved here. Is that something you've you've looked at at all? Well, I've certainly thought about it, and uh, the the attorney Sharon Eubanks led the nine month trial uh, for the United States Justice Department against the tobacco companies. Has spoken out publicly and said that she thinks that um, fossil fuel companies and Exxon in particular are susceptible to a RICO type lawsuit. Um, so uh, it's a distinct possibility, and there have been some calls by U.S. senators to look at it. So um, you know, it, it's something. Uh, that certainly merits the uh, U.S. Justice Department's attention, and and I believe Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders have on, on record saying that uh, if they're elected, that they want the U.S. Justice Department to take a look at this issue. And the state of California has launched its investigation. The state of New York has also launched an investigation where, of course, um, Exxon is headquartered. Um, do you know if any other states um, are also talking about possibly launching investigations? You know, I believe Exxon's headquartered in Texas. Oh, you're right. Um, Excuse me. Yeah. <laughs> and they're incorporated in New Jersey, which may be what, what you're thinking okay. about. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, no other state has publicly acknowledged that it's it's investigating Exxon. Um, but it wouldn't surprise me to know that some of them are. Uh, attorneys general often, um, you know, work in tandem with each other as they did in, you know, many cases, whether, you know, it's the antitrust cases uh, against you know, Microsoft or uh, whether it was tobacco or anything else. So uh, it wouldn't surprise me to know that there are other attorneys general who are taking a hard look at this and trying to uh, determine whether or not um, a case should be brought, an investigation uh, might even be ongoing. We wouldn't know about it. Well, excellent. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, and um, again, that's Matt Powell with the Powell Legal Group in Washington, D.C. And um, I know that there are um, many uh, activists in our in our audience who are interested in getting involved. I know that um, 350.org is one of the groups in California that's been very active in this case, so that's a good place to look for more information. And um, we are out of time for this show, so I want to thank you again, Matt. Um, I want to thank KPFA listeners. I want to thank you for joining us on Terra Verde today, Erica Bridgman for being our engineer. Um, the show is also available on kpfa.org for you to listen to at your convenience and thank you so much for having me today do you know what area 941 is it's kpfa.org's new podcasting space this allows us to expand our programming with more on-demand programs so you can listen when you want or download them at any time Area 941 is just another reason why people say, I heard it on KPFA. A few years ago, Rebecca Solnit's book, Hope in the Dark, gained an instant audience among progressives. Now, a new expanded Hope in the Dark is being published. 
Rebecca Solnit will be presenting it on Wednesday evening, March 9th at the Hillside Club, 2286 Cedar Street in Berkeley. This is a KPFA 